Greg and I met uh, about six months ago. He was here looking at some of our clocks and uh, doing a repair job, I believe, on one. And so, um, Greg is a horological, it's a tough word, conservator, a professor and provides consultation to the National Watch and Clock Museum in Columbia, Pennsylvania. He is a nationally recognized furniture maker who has been featured in Colonial Homes Magazine and the Master Class Series. He returned to Europe to study the Beaux Arts in England, Italy, and France in the early 2000s, attaining an advanced degree in furniture and wooden artifact conservation from the infamous Louvre Museum in Paris, France. At present, he is the principal of two restoration conservation studios specializing in 17th to 19th century furniture, clocks, and important historic home preservations. I think we were very lucky that you came here six months ago. And uh, we invited him to present this morning, so enjoy his lecture on 18th century tall case clocks. Hey, good morning. We have a good crowd here today. Uh, I, I'm not going to judge everyone's age, but uh, I, I wish we could get some younger people from time to time. It's part of the issue, as you know, with historical materialism and antiquity. But uh, nevertheless, I'm sure we have some very interesting people for one reason or another here today. So what we're going we're gonna to do today is chat just a bit about uh, the development of the tall case clock whether it be here in Reading, or its origins, which are in England, um, actually in Holland, is where the, the tall case clocks are. Uh, we're going to try to come through this with a PowerPoint in the beginning, just to get a little bit of background, uh, a little bit of side stories, uh, go through a little bit of lecture, and some, actually some stories in between, and we'll finish up. And I guess Simon will let me know in about 45 minutes, uh, you know, when we can have some questions. Again, thanks for everyone at the History Center for inviting me here. Uh, it's going to be a lively presentation, I hope, okay? Clocks actually started with watches going back to the 15th century. Uh, this is the oldest known movement in the history of the world. It still works. It's in Salisbury, Chapel, Salisbury, a very beautiful place. Uh, it was pulled out of service about 10 years ago. Uh, it has, has had constant, obviously constant restoration uh, over the years, but uh, that's a good thing. So I was, part of my time at the British Horological Institute was to go oversee the process and just to understand what was going on. Uh, here you have the time control that's called a folio. Okay, it was the first type of time controller. And the folio, those two, uh, those two wings there, and that actually tries to keep you within second to second to second to second. Because typically your long case clock, every swing and to and fro of the pendulum, every vibration is a second. Okay, but not so with this guy. This, this thing was probably accurate within three hours a day in the 1550s. And the, the great thing is they didn't, they didn't upgrade the timekeeping, okay? And working with the National Watch and Clock Museum, my own practice, too many clocks and watches come, come in and we see upgrades over the years. Upgrades when technology upgraded. You're talking about the 1600s, the 1700s, 18th century. And these occurred all the time. So it's a good thing, but what it did was destroy our historic, historic materialism. And I'm here to save historic materialism. So uh, I can get sidetracked in many ways here. But uh, what we try to do, or what I try to do, is put back clocks, particularly clocks, back to where they should be. The biggest issue with the clock maker today, with me coming, the items coming in, is making up for everyone else's bad judgment, lack of training. I would say 85% is undoing bad repairs, and then making the correct repair. The bad repair could have lasted for 80 or 90 years, but it could have caused additional wear and other problems with the mechanism at hand. So, at present, when you come to my studio here, you're going to get horological 
repair, conservation, restoration, and the case. So I started doing the furniture 35 years ago. So I do case restoration, and that's for my training at the Louvre Museum in Paris. My horological education, again, was from the NAWCC. It was two years there. First year, second year as a fellowship, 10, 12 years later. And then the British Horological Institute in Midlands. And no one takes horology more serious than the British. Um, I'm not going to say it's a walk in the park out at the NAWCC, but the school is it's like T-ball in the major leagues. Uh, every night, somewhere in England, there could be 50 horological groups meeting in a pub. And we're not going to a pub to get entertained. We're talking about horological issues we have in our shops. So it's a very important feature. So when there are issues here, I migrate back vis-a-vis -vis phone or in person to the Brits. So we'll move on. So the oldest known mechanism. So from the folio, those wing portions on that gigantic movement, which weighs about 2,000 pounds, an upgrade was called a balance wheel. This goes one second round, one second back, one second round, one second back. And if you took the bell off, this is under the bell. This is the hammer that hits the bell. Okay. With the balance wheel type operation, it provided a couple things. You got accuracy probably within an hour and a half and 24 hours. Good thing. And this clock is a clock that was made for the home. Okay. Only the affluent could afford this clock, though. Nevertheless. Timekeeping in about 1656, 1660, there was a race. There was a race amongst horologists of the time, basically Dutch and French, of why the state did not keep accurate time to the minute. Uh, only the scientists knew minutes in the 18th century, not so much the common lay person. They were relegated to the hour. So if you were fortunate enough to own a tall case clock, which you would have had an upper, upper class means at least, you would have purchased one with a very large bell, probably a six inch diameter bell, because chances are you were a farmer doing something outside and you needed to hear the time, whether you're receiving customers, it's time to eat, time to do this, time to do that. So these bells were very important. But nevertheless, this meter pendulum, uh, when it was adjusted or adapted to the clock movement, the wall movement, uh, was a real boost for accuracy. And through the next 150 years, accuracy continued to grow. And again, we're talking, we're going back, we're talking about the roots, the horological roots starting by, actually it started by the Dutch in Rotterdam and Amsterdam. And by the time they got to London, they started teaching this in schools in about 1630, how to build clocks. The first clockmakers, such as that clock in Salisbury, uh, were made by the blacksmiths. So somewhere along the way, the information is very shaky, the blacksmith developed a clock. It later honed, components honed, levers, gears by the locksmith. So they're the two beginning smiths or trades that began the essence of clock making in the world. And it went from the Dutch, which are real sticklers, the real scientists, hardcore mathematicians and engineers back in the 15th and 16th century. It flowed to the French. The French honed it more. The French had sociological issues going into the mid 17th century. And the English said, you French scientists and horologists, come on over. Even though you're not a religion, we'll take you. And they took French Huguenots by the boatload, horologists, scientists, to create the clock mechanisms and watch mechanisms. Watches go back to around the 13th century. It was called something of a table clock. It was a humongous watch, about nine inches in diameter, and would sit horizontally on a table. And again, a two to three to four hour timekeeper in its day. But again, that segue to the Salzburg clock. So we come up to 1636. Um, we have a lot of the English horologists that are not happy in their they're petitioning the king. They want to know why the government is not protecting us. It's a common thing here. Why is it not protecting us? 
because they brought the Huguenots over by boat boats, and the English were not trained. They were, they were an ill-formed apprenticeship, if anything at all. So King George first came out and said, we're going to start a guild, we're going to start a guild that's going to protect our own people from those nasty immigrants coming over the border. But yet, the king wanted the immigrants to come over the border to train the English. So it accomplished a couple of things. It made the English very quickly, within 20 years, probably by 16, 1650, 1660, they were, they were the world leader in the timepieces of neurology. The second thing is, was that the king set up a council to standardize horological components. If something was made in Glasgow, um, and it would be a, the third year of the time train would match the year made in Wales. So if you, were, if you were in the guild and you were protected, you were protected from lawsuits, liabilities, from everything. So it was a very important thing to get into with the king. If you were outside, and it also determined where you could sell your clocks to, and if you were in the guild, you had to put your name and location on that you were selling from. And this is in the beginning. 